Good morning. We would go ahead and call our MAPS for um, Citizen Advisory Board meeting for January 6th, 2022 to order. Thank you all very much for being here today and hope you had um, wonderful holidays and a good start to this year. Um, so we'll move to item number two, approval of the minutes of the December 2nd, 2021 MAPS meeting. Take a motion and a second. Okay, please cast your votes. Okay, the motion passed. Thank you so much. Now, moving on to um, number, item number three, items for individual consideration. Um, A is to receive the MAPS 4 monthly financial report ending November 30th, 2021. David. Thank you, Madam Chair. You have in your packet the MAPS 4 monthly financial report for the period ending November 30th, 2021. <clears throat> Pardon me, in its usual form. On the revenue side for the month, it's $11,116,009. Total sales tax collection of $180,498,315. And then on the expenditure side for the month, $64,093 and a total of $1,231,185. I'll try to answer any questions if you have any. I will point out that <clears throat> we started the year about 7.3% below projections now uh, as per this report, we are uh, half a percent above projections, so we have recovered. Woohoo, that's outstanding. And we don't even have our Christmas shopping numbers in there yet. That's right. Yay. Um, any questions about the report? If not, I would take a motion and a second to accept the report. Please vote. Motion passes, thank you very much. Okay, moving on to item B. Um, recommend receipt of the consultant review committee for, oops, um, for the MAPS 4 bus stop improvements phase one and authorized negotiation of an inter engineering service contract. Uh, so this is one of the first projects that uh, is, is starting and um, per the presentation that I gave yesterday, this is in that same process that we talked about for selecting architects and engineers. There was a letter that was sent out asking for uh, letters of interest. <clears throat> Those came in, um, uh, members of the subcommittee and, and uh, Public Works and myself went through those, those letters and shortlisted uh, uh, three firms and then the interviews were, were conducted and um, ultimately Kimley Horn has been selected and we're asking for authorization to negotiate a contract with them so that we can do this first, uh, this first round of bus stops. Any questions? <coughs> Russell, anything to add? Great, okay. If there's no questions, take a motion and a second. Thank you, class your votes. <coughs> Motion passes. We are off, folks. <coughs> All righty. So moving on to um, item C. Recommend approval of request for proposals for the MAPS for Henrietta B. Foster uh, Center Operating Partner. <coughs> Thank you. This, as you said, is a request for proposals. Um, Jason Cotton with ADG is here today to give you details on this RFP. <laughs> Thank you, David. Morning, Madam Chair, board members. Great to see everyone this morning. Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, it has been a long week, I will tell you that. Uh, there were uh, obviously six of our first set of subcommittees meeting with, uh, first set of subcommittee meetings were this week. Uh, many of you attended one or more of those, and so uh, for David and his staff and myself and our team, uh, we attended all six, and so it's been a busy week, and so uh, I think I said it at the meetings, but really appreciate everyone's involvement and uh, just taking the time to be a part of the process. It, it was a really uh, busy but productive week. And so um, the uh, presentation that we have this morning, as David mentioned, this is uh, we're bringing forward for your consideration a request for proposal for an operator for the Henrietta B. Foster Center. 
And so this is not unlike some of the other uh, conversations that we've had previously for some of the other operator RFPs. And so uh, we have a lot of business to attend to this morning, or you, you have a lot of business to attend to, and so we're going to go through this pretty quick, um, but I just want to hit the high points of the RFP. So uh, uh, with the subcommittee uh, this week, we felt like the best place to start was the schedule, and so this is obviously the schedule that's in the implementation plan. Uh, obviously, we're focused here this morning on the, on the uh, Henrietta B. Foster Center, and so you can see here on uh, the slide in front of you, this is how the project lays out from a schedule perspective. Uh, and really, the presentation this morning is uh, uh, really zeroing in on this gray bar, the operator selection and agreement. And so, uh, as we've described previously, really, we kind of organized this uh, effort into three major phases or groups of activities. And so, uh, the first part of this deals with advertisement, uh, and then we move into kind of a selection phase of work, and then obviously the development of the agreement. <laughs> And so you as a board will be involved at various points in this process. We're really early on in this process. Uh, each one of these blue triangles are really formal actions that this, that this board will take in terms of making recommendations to council. Um, and so to give you a little bit of context, this is where we're at. We're just in this initial phase. We're bringing forward this RFP. Uh, once uh, the, the RFP is uh, approved by council, it'll authorize staff to, to uh, release that and we'll begin uh, uh, really the selection process. And so we're really just at the, as I said, at the beginning of this process. So uh, just, a, just a brief overview, as I mentioned, the RFP is actually in your packet. Uh, the, sh the form of the RFP follows very closely with all of the other RFPs that we have released and will be releasing. Uh, we have all of the same information. There's a background section that describes the project in some detail. Uh, there is uh, a section on just the scope of the project, requirements of the project that we're aware of as of today. Uh, there's some language in the RFP related to land and building ownership. There also uh, is a pretty extensive section on submittal requirements, and so you'll notice that in the RFP. Uh, there is a lot of information in the back of the RFP which really kind of sets out the general terms of the contract, at least as the city anticipates it to look. And so um, all of that information is included in the RFP for the benefit of any respondents that may be uh, interested in operating the facility. Um, and then really the, the RFP just finishes up with uh, a brief section in terms of how the proposals will, will be reviewed. Um, and so you'll find that in there as well. So a, a little bit, just some additional information on the RFP specifically. Obviously we're looking for an operator for the Henrietta B. Foster Center. Uh, Center for Northeast Small Business Development and Entrepreneurship, and uh, so we've spelled that in the RFP. It is a, uh, if you'll remember from uh, the resolution, this is a $15 million project, specifically focused on aiding minority uh, businesses, small and disadvantaged businesses, um, and it's really one of four projects in the Innovation District um, that are really encouraging development inside of the district, and so I'm really excited to move this one forward. Um, we are, uh, obviously this is one of the first things that we need to take care of, and so the, the goal here is to bring this operating partner on board quickly um, so that they can help participate in design and programming of the facility, and so we spell that out uh, a little bit in the RFP. Um, we provide a brief history of the facility in the RFP. Uh, obviously this was uh, one of the only YMCAs that was available uh, during segregation, and so it has some historical significance, and so we speak to that a little bit in the RFP. Um, we also uh, talk a little bit in the RFP, for those of you that aren't aware, you may recall from our uh, prior conversations, but programmatically there are some things happening inside of the existing facility uh, in terms of uh, uh, City of Oklahoma City Parks Department, uh, specifically lifeguard training, uh, as I understand it, that are happening in the facility now. Uh, those activities are planned to move to the, the new Willow D. Johnson Center when it opens, and so there are some moving pieces to this, and so we've tried uh, our best to explain that to potential respondents so they understand how all of these projects interact with one another. Um, we, we also provided a description of what we called early visioning, and so a lot of this language that you see here uh, is straight from the resolution. It really, I think, uh, our goal here was to spell out the intent of council uh, for those that maybe have not uh, uh, attended the meetings or been uh, a part of this process to this point just trying to make sure that people, uh, potential respondents who may be interested in uh, operating the facility, that they understand what the goal was uh, of the facility. Um, we also uh, spend some time talking about potential uh, programmatic elements. We talk about co-working spaces, flex work spaces, classroom spaces, and so we spell all of that out in the RFP, uh, again, for the benefit of people who may not have been present while the conversations were going on publicly. 
Um, we do, uh, uh, we do uh, spell out in the RFP, as we have in the others, that the city really requires either a single entity respond uh, or, uh, or a consortium of multiple entities under a common legal entity, that the city has some specific requirements in terms of how it can contract with a potential operator. And so we've tried to make that clear in the RFP in terms of what the city will require. <clears throat> um, we do uh, also in the RFP, we spell out as we have in others, the successful uh, uh, respondent will have relevant experience, uh, be able to provide programs and act activities that serve that, identify clientele, and then obviously have the fiscal and service capacity to manage and operate the facility. Um, there, there is a potential, the Henrietta B. Foster Center, um, you know, it's not like there are a lot of other Henrietta B. Foster Centers out in Oklahoma City, and so it is completely likely that there will be people that, or entities that are interested in responding uh, that may not have ever operated a center quite like this, uh, but it's probably also likely that those entities that are interested are maybe have similar experience in related fields or related areas, and so we give them, we spell out in the RFP that uh, Agencies like that are absolutely appropriate and uh, able to respond. They just need to spell that out for the benefit of the selection committee. <clears throat> um, we, uh, as I said, we spend some time in the RFP talking about specific submittal requirements. And so this is the section of the RFP where we basically uh, spell out all of the information that we would like to see from the respondents. And so I'm not gonna go through uh, this list in detail. Uh, you can see here the, the general uh, groups of information that we have requested as a part of this RFP. Uh, probably one of the more important ones you'll see in this list, business plan, and so we've asked the respondents to provide a basically a five-year business plan so that we have an understanding of what their operating expenses will be, how they intend to staff uh, the facility, what types of programs and services they're going to offer. All of those things are really important to the city and making sure that the city has an understanding of how the the uh, uh, operator will be uh, functioning through the first five years of operation. Uh, and then lastly, as I mentioned previously, there's a, uh, I think it's a one page summary of essentially how the proposals will be evaluated. And so again, I'm not gonna go through this list exhaustively. It's very similar um, to some of the other lists that we've looked at. It generally lines up with the submittal requirements that I just went through. And so we've spelled out for uh, the respondents uh, and uh, how their uh, letters of interest will be graded or scored. Um, and so uh, a little bit on schedule. As I said, we're very early on in this process, assuming that this board uh, recommends to council that this RFP be approved. We uh, could potentially be, uh, uh, this RFP could be considered by council on the January 18th meeting. Um, we would advertise uh, shortly thereafter. I'm showing January 19th here. <coughs> Uh, we would have our pre-proposal conference, which we talked a little bit with some of the subcommittees this week. We'd have our pre-proposal conference uh, on February 9th, so any of the potential respondents could come in and ask questions about the RFP. Uh, we would, uh, uh, we've identified here March 9th that we would receive letters of interest or proposals, uh, and then really March and April would be time that the selection committee would spend in reviewing those, uh, having interviews if necessary, uh, and making a recommendation in terms of an operator. So. Um, that's really it. I would be pleased to answer any questions that anyone has on the on the presentation. Any questions for Jason? No questions. No. Uh, this comes with the recommendation from the innovation <laughs> subcommittee. Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jason. So we do have a citizen that has signed up to speak on this topic. Um, Mr. Washington, you have three minutes. Well, 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 my illustrious esteemed guests and participators. <coughs> I myself would love uh, to be an operator of this profound facility. Now then, I'm looking forward to becoming a part of this so-called pre-proposed meeting and gathering for discussions regarding it. Let me say, though, I have a slight problem with it being in the so-called district of the so-called innovation district. Now, I understand this. I'm, my understanding of it, quite naturally, is prematurely absorbed into questions of doubt. But let me say this here. Is this not an actual hub for the white business owners to move in with the gentrification that's already going on on the east side? but covering up and saying that this is just a, 
uh, Miss Foster type of uh, setting, it's just for everybody. I have a question with that, everyone. Now, advertising, selection, agreement, development. I don't understand why this is not coming forward to the African American community in a setting maybe like the new apartment complex that was built on 6th and High Street, the old, old Douglas School. How come we can't have people in that area come in and sit down and get an understanding, not just come skip. A lot of us don't come down here like me. <laughs> okay, I come down all the time. I was at the city council yesterday. I had fun. What was it, Tuesday? No, Tuesday. But I'm saying to y'all, we cannot allow this money to just be rambunctiously selected and given to certain friends and buddies of people's because we already know that this is designed for that reason. And we have to prevent that. And I myself would like to be an expert negotiator. I would like to run this op a operating partner of the $15 million project. And I guarantee y'all what? If I run it, well, you can just believe we're going to have some more people want to come in from out of town and all that want to be a part of this project. Because I am ice water when it comes to it. In closing, let me say that I will not permit any underhanded behavior coming into the African American community. Well, I'll say what used to be mine. You have I'm just a spot. Seconds. Is that it? 30 seconds. Oh, 30 seconds. I know I'm just a spot in my own community now. I can't call any place in any, where here in Oklahoma black anymore. <laughs> but what I would like to do is have my footprint you know, in that thing that goes on in the African American community from this day forward. I'll start a visa baby because I will be back. Thank you. Okay, any other comments on the item? Okay, if not, we will take a motion and a second for approval. Please vote. Okay, the motion passes. Thank you so much. Okay, moving on to item D. Uh, recommend approval of the master development agreement for the MAPS 4 Innovation Hall between Oklahoma City Redevelopment Authority, the City of Oklahoma City, and BT Development. This is a, a complicated project, and we have a, a short presentation here. Kathy O'Connor from the Alliance and, and Mark Baffert is here. Um, I don't know how you want to approach it today. I want to start with Mark. <clears throat> I'd like to invite him up to explain the project so help us better understand that. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to present this uh, project. We're really excited for it. Uh, our site sits uh, just south of Baker Hughes facility. It's called the Convergence. <coughs> and you'll see on the screen there, the site is identified there. It sits right in between the Research Park and OSU Discovery. We bought this particular site uh, December of uh, uh, 2020. Uh, this is an aerial view that kind of shows the site as it sits. Uh, we have an office tower in a Stiles Hotel or a hotel and then we have the proposed innovation hall that we hope that you guys will approve today for us to develop with you. You can see we have a, an orange line that uh, connects us from the uh, OU Research Park up to the OSU Discovery. Uh, we believe it's uh, imperative that any innovation uh, district has multiple universities working together and we think that we're going to help be that link between the two universities. Um, this is a little um, description and I'll, I'll read it because I think it's very important. A place where people come together to establish a new beginning and lay a groundwork for the future. In keeping with the spirit of its physical positioning, the convergence development will continue that legacy as an elevated platform for exploration, collaboration and creation. This new destination provides creative minds from all walks of life a place to come together to share ideas and shape the future. So that's kind of our, our mantra and, and uh, we're really excited for it. So uh, first is we have an office building. Those are some of the amenities we'll have in our office building is 211,000 square feet. We will have 50,000 square feet of lab space. Our anchor tenant will be Wheeler Bio and that lab space will be open to the public from uh, what we call the pedestrian plaza, you'll be able to see actual uh, laboratory space, uh, 
uh, going on on a day-to-day -day basis. One of the key features of our project is subterranean parking. We do not have a parking structure uh, that we're building. We felt like it was very key as we, uh, we or as the city continues to develop the innovation district. It becomes very walkable, very open to the general public, and we didn't want a parking garage um, impeding that. So we actually have subterranean parking. So everything you'll see will be all pedestrian. Um, moving on to, uh, we have a hotel, which is 107 Keys. It is the front door. It sits on 8th Street, and 8th Street is the connecting point from downtown into the Health Science Center area. Those are some of the amenities, and again, it will be a full service hotel, and it has 107 Keys. Uh, the Innovation Hall, uh, we have a site that's proposed on ours that uh, we hope that we again we can build together um, we haven't started the design of that you guys need to approve that before we can but part of our uh, well Kathy will describe it here in a little bit but uh, uh, part of what we're agreeing to do is pay for the architectural fees as well as donate 10 million dollars which is required by the maps to get the 10 million dollars for innovation hall so uh, go through that one of the key elements of our site sits uh, is Stiles Park, which is where the Beacon of Hope currently is. It, uh, Stiles Park is the oldest park in the city, so we don't take that. I didn't realize that as we were started this development, but uh, as we went through some research and found out that it is the oldest park, we want to continue that, and the Beacon of Hope will stay right where it is, and we'll build around it. And it's actually going to be the key element that really. Oh, it's going to stay there. Uh, it'll be the key element that really helps uh, 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 provide a staple for our park. We'll have uh, two different areas. You'll see the middle section is a, is a little piece that actually sits in between our office tower and uh, the OSU Discovery Facility. And the top and bottom piece is the piece that's just directly north of the current Beacon of Hope. And it'll be a land, long landscape area that, again, will be open 24 hours a day for the public. Um, one of the key elements of our site is what we call the public realm, is we want this to be an inviting, a connected, a connective piece throughout the, the district. And we have what we call V-shaped connectivity, which is the beacon of Cope is the bottom of the V. The left side of the V actually connects you from OSU Discovery down to OU, and the right side actually extends on the east side of the proposed innovation hall and that actually connects you into the remaining portion of the innovation district where other development will happen. So the whole development is geared around not just our development, but is for the public going forward. Uh, we also have, as you see of our plan up in the upper left-hand corner, we have a third floor elevated plaza that will connect both the office tower and the hotel and also will be a public area. As you can see, our project is $177.5 million, of which uh, I won't go through each one of those, but you can get a flavor of uh, the, the magnitude of the dollars that are planned for this particular project. And then you can also uh, give you a summary of what our uh, financing is within the project. <coughs> And then, uh, so our commitment to you is that we will build this third floor plaza area and make it open to the public. We are going to uh, maintain the innovation hall at our expense going forward. We're going to provide $10 million to match the MAPS 4 funding, as well as we will maintain Styles Park as well as the streetscapes on our nickel. Our timeline is hopefully today or this month uh, after hopefully you guys will approve it and we'll go to city council on january 18th so you guys do approve it so we'll get a master development agreement uh we'll uh wrap up the discussions on styles park with the city we'll fund our project uh, at the end of march we'll break ground in april and we will finish two years from now so our uh, grand opening um uh, march of 2024. Uh, thank you, and uh, open up for questions. Any questions for Mr. Befford? And, and just as a reminder, in the resolution, in the MAPS 4 resolution, it was envisioned that um, the $10 million from MAPS 4 would be a part of um, a larger development. This was the, the 
this is a unique project in that it's not that Oklahoma City will own this project like the other projects. So it is, it is quite a different um, intention even from the resolution. So other, other questions? Okay, Kathy? Thank you. I just wanted to walk through the master development agreement with you briefly and talk a little bit about um, the requirements in it, the requirements of the developer and the requirements of the redevelopment authority in order to execute this project. As um, Teresa mentioned, the uh, MAPS 4 resolution requires that in order to, to access $10 million in MAPS 4 money, $10 million has to be provided from non-MAP sources for Innovation Hall and related infrastructure. So this um, project and this proposal um, gives us a way to uh, access the $10 million in MAPS money and the $10 million in private resources to make Innovation Hall happen. Um, this just kind of walks back through some of the funding associated with the project. Um, I will point out that it does include a tax increment financing allocation through the Oklahoma City Redevelopment Authority. Um, the Redevelopment Authority manages the TIF district that's, that's where the Innovation District is located. Um, that was approved by the Redevelopment Authority last month. Um, the other complicated component of this project is that it will use New Markets tax credits, which are a federal tax credit program for um, low-income communities. We have used them in the past on the Skirvin Hotel um, and most recently on the Homeland Grocery Store. And in fact, this master development agreement idea is very similar to what we did on the Homeland where we had a private developer building the grocery store and making, doing some of the improvements on behalf of the city that will help with the senior wellness center that's located there. The master development agreement is between the redevelopment authority, the developer, and the city. Um, it, it provides how the $10 million in matching funds will go into the project and access the $10 million in MAPS funding. Um, it requires the developer to provide evidence to OCRA, of the redevelopment authority, that, we, that they will expend a minimum of $10 million. Um, they will provide all the pre-development services for Innovation Hall, as Mark mentioned. That includes all the architectural and engineering services, so that those are being completed not at the expense of the city. They will submit floor plans and elevations to the Innovation District Subcommittee and to you um, for your review and recommendations. Um, the developer will construct, operate, and maintain Innovation Hall, and by operate, what I mean is the physical operations of the building, the heating and air, and the janitorial services, and all of the other things that go into taking care of a, a building like this. The, in, the Innovation District, the Innovation Hall operator will be selected by the city, and it will operate this facility on behalf of the city. We will not have any, um, we'll have involvement with that entity, obviously, eventually during the construction and things like that, but the selection of that operator is up to city council and you. Um, and finally, the redeveloper will convey title to the land where Innovation Hall will be located. Good for us, Either to the redevelopment authority or the city after construction is complete. So the land that Innovation Hall sits on will be owned by the city. The wow. building itself will be um, leased to a operating entity or a management entity that is a part of the New Markets tax credit structure. And for the seven year period of the New Markets, it will be owned by that entity, and at the end of that, it can be transferred either to the city or to the redevelopment authority, whichever the city prefers. So this will be a city facility. It will be open to the public um, and available for the public to use. It requires OCRA to exercise oversight consistent with the resolution of intent, the MAPS 4 resolution of intent, and the project plan for the Innovation District. And the project plan is the document adopted by City Council that sets out how the Innovation District will be developed 
and um, the services and the, the features that will be a part of that um, area. Um, we'll negotiate and enter into any economic development agreements. That is a part of the tax increment financing process and also gives the redevelopment authority um, even a higher level of design review and um, project oversight than is typical of other um, MAPS projects. And finally, we'll provide annual reports to the city on the operation of Innovation Hall, um, and during construction, um, those reports will be monthly. This is a breakdown of the costs related to Innovation Hall, and this is Innovation Hall construction and the related infrastructure. Um, it, it includes land, infrastructure, the cost of the shell of the building, interior improvements, um, the parking, and then the soft costs that I mentioned earlier. Um, we've broken it down in, so that it would come out in even numbers, but um, as you see, there's a little bit more than 10 million allocated to MAPS-4, obviously that'll end up just being just 10 million, um, but that includes the shell cost, the interior improvements, the finish out of the space, and the FF&E, which is the furniture, fixtures, and equipment that will go into the, the project. And the developer will provide the other $10 million associated with the development. The parking, um, in the parking it is subterranean, um, and 90 spaces will be allocated to Innovation Hall for use by the hall for any of its events, activities, programs that are um, going to be taking place. And this is just our timeline. Um, Mark went through that already, but we are looking to um, try to get the design of Innovation Hall to the subcommittees and to you in February and plan for an April groundbreaking. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. Any questions for Kathy? Okay. Thank you so much. Appreciate all of that information. Yes, I'm sorry. Oh, oh I'm sorry, uh, Kathy. Wait a second, Bob. Kathy, just real quickly, I noticed on uh, uh, the summary that it's called C C space or C pace funding. Oh, C pace. What, yes. What, what is that? One of the funding sources is um, a new program that was recently approved by Oklahoma County. Um, called CPACE, which is Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy um, Bonds, basically, or a loan. So for certain parts of the building's construction that help its environmental um, friendliness and make it operate more environmentally friendly, they can fund those through CPACE financing. And it can include things like windows, the heat and air system, the roof, um, to use more energy efficient materials and systems, um, and those can be financed through that funding source. Thanks, I didn't recognize the acronym. We, so. we have not, we're working on our first project right now. The county commissioners approved it in November, I think, yeah, so. Thanks. Yeah. Good question, any, any other questions? Okay, now I think, thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, any other comments? As a reminder, like David said, that this is coming as um, a recommended approved um, item from the subcommittee. So I think, you know, no, this E. Okay. Is yeah. C? No, this is item okay. D. Yeah, okay. Okay, so um, we'll take a motion and a second. Y'all can speak with y'all both on it. Y'all can speak with y'all both on it. Y'all can speak with y'all both on Mr. Washington, you signed up for item 3E. I got foot three, four on that, four on that, E. Sir, I'll, I'll show you. Mark, would you come get That's the form? That. It's well, E. Man, I gave you two of them up there, like four and C. E, C, and E. I gave you two of them. I'm not crazy, man. I highly tell you. Sir, here. Mark, would you come get the ones that, I, that he has signed up for? Or here, I'll give you those. E, C, E, three. Um, or 3E and 4. Right, e. That's 3E. That's this is D. This is item 3D. Okay. Yeah. Moving forward. We'll take a motion and a second. Please cast your votes. Okay. You need to go back to computer. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Y'all, that's okay. Y'all got me right. Man, I don't want to let that one go. That's Gosh, okay. Gosh, hang on. I'm not right up right quick. You got to sign up. You know the process, Mr. Washington. Man, you're right. You got it. Y'all, you know. Man, I Okay. Motion passes. Thank you so much. You're right. Dude. Okay. Moving on to item 3E, um, recommend resolution waive, uh, require, waiving the requirement for city council um, authorization to negotiate a contract and approve the architectural services contract with Populous for the phase one improvements and phase two improvements for the downtown arena. Uh, um, Madam Chair, this one is very similar to item B. Uh, however, we have waived that process where we ask for authorization to negotiate. Um, it's, it's important that we get started on the improvements with the, uh, the arena, so we've waived this one month period. It, it saves us up 30 to almost 60 days sometimes. Um, so we've gone through the same process, letters of interest, shortlisted interviews, and, and selected populace to do the work at the arena, and again, the the only thing that we're waiving is the process where we ask for permission to negotiate and then we negotiate it. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> and it comes with the approval from the subcommittee. Okay. Yes. I, I do have a question. Sure. Being new to uh -huh. all of these processes, is this a common thing? I mean, is this something that's done? I, I, I assume it's done rarely, but it is done. It's not unusual that's exactly right if if we're um, under um, a time constraint where we really need to get something going and, and the the interview team was all in agreement that this was the best firm and we feel like it's it's everybody is in agreement sometimes we do this you're right it's it's rare but commonly rare and we are rare. simply recommending it to city council <laughs> city council who has I would assume a lot more experience than I do with this. Absolutely. They, they have to approve it as well. Yes, so they are yeah. the ones that actually approve it, yes. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Mr. Washington, you did sign up to speak on <clears throat> item 3E. Now, I just want to formally make my apologies for that, because like I said, I'm one quick person that, that, that makes a mistake. I'm quick to assume my responsibility, but on that, no, I didn't want to speak on this one. I let the other one go away. How did I do it? Oh. Thank you. Oh. Okay, we'll take a motion in a second. Please cast your vote. <coughs> okay. I'll go verbal to you. Okay. All right, the motion passes. Thank you. We are getting some business done, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so on to item four, discussion items. Do we have any additional items? We don't have anything. Okay, all righty. And Mr. Washington, you did sign up from, to speak on item four, discussion items. This is item four, no. Oh, I thought it was four. Oh, oh, citizen. Six. Oh, six. Okay, my, my, my apologies. Okay, um, so no discussion items. Information items. Item number five. Um, preliminary report um, on the maps for uh, fairgrounds coliseum. Yes, ma'am. As a reminder, that the um, fairgrounds coliseum was advanced with maps three excess collections money to, to begin design because of the. The need for new facility out there, um, it's so important to the horse industry, <clears throat> and it's a, a very old building, so the council found it necessary to advance that. That work has uh, progressed so far. The preliminary report has been approved by city council and through MAPS 3, but I wanted to bring it to the MAPS 4 board because ultimately, as soon as those plans are complete, then MAPS 4 will be responsible for the construction of that project. So I wanted to keep you up to date on that. Travis Polly is here today from Populous, and um, he's gonna give you the details of the preliminary report. Thank you all. <clears throat> Thanks for having me this morning. Uh, happy to be here to present this, this exciting project for the city and for the fairgrounds. 
So we'll walk through a quick presentation of where we are right now. Like David said, uh, we just got this approved by council uh, last December, so we're excited to be moving forward with it. So as you all know, where the fairgrounds is just out a few miles west of here. Um, just a few items to note here. We've got I-44 on our western boundary, I-40 on our southern boundary, and then our main entry into the Coliseum area is right there off of May Avenue on Gordon Cooper Boulevard where you see that orange arrow. Um, zooming into our site here, you see the Norwalk Arena that we're replacing right there in the middle, the Super Barn directly north of it, and then the Bennett Event Center right there on our east side. The Norwalk Arena, built in 1965, is currently the uh, largest economic impact of any publicly owned facility in Oklahoma City, uh, full year round with over 250 event days, known as the horse show capital of the world, uh, tons of equine and livestock events out there, as well as, of course, we know um, state championship basketball, wrestling, uh, Disney on Ice during the fair and other events like that. The new Coliseum is planned to go directly south of the existing Norwalk Arena, um, as shown there in that ghosted outline. Um, the intent of that is to keep the Norwalk operational throughout the construction of the new Coliseum. We have long-term contracts out there at the existing Norwalk that we don't want to disrupt, so the idea is that we'll keep that operational throughout the two-year construction of that new Coliseum, build that right up against it, and then um, demo the, the existing Norwalk. You can also see some utility restrictions there that kind of dictated how far away from the Norwalk we could pull that, as well as kind of dictating the shape of the new Coliseum. <coughs> so as you can see, it overlaps there just slightly with the Norwalk because of how far we could pull it out. So this will be done in phases. Phase one will be the selective demolition and temporary construction of that area where we are overlapping, relocating some of our egress elements um, to the north side where we can, where we can relocate those. Phase two will be the construction of the new Coliseum, as well as a temporary path from the super barns to the new Coliseum for all of those equine and livestock events to get to the new Coliseum um, during demolition phase of the Nork. Phase three would be the demolition of the Nork when that temporary path would be utilized to get to the new Coliseum. <clears throat> and phase four will be the demolition of the Nork and the site work that occurs where the Nork used to be, as well as the reconstruction of the show office that is currently located within the Nork Arena. Uh, so here's a zoomed in site plan of that, of that image. The built structure is there in orange. You can see that approach off of Gordon Cooper Boulevard that I mentioned on the first slide. Uh, we're gonna have a really nice entry there uh, greeting you right as you drive up Gordon Cooper Boulevard with the main entry of the building, kind of like that first slide you saw with Bennett Event Center right there on our right capping that off. Um, we've got a nice outdoor flexible plaza space on the north side that will extend all the way um, to the super barn once that connector is done, um, connecting it to the fair, fairgrounds and providing some nice outdoor space. Our entry plaza there on your right side, and then on the south side is kind of more of our utilitarian functions with the chiller yard, loading dock, and things like that. On the east side, we've left that kind of as a little bit of a blank slate, knowing that the, temp the uh, future connector building will go there, and we don't want to put a lot of dollars into the site work there that's going to be ripped up shortly thereafter when that connector building is done. So we've left that kind of just as some simple paving that the fair can use in that interim time and some sod area. As we zoom into the floor plans here, we've got two levels to the new Coliseum. This is the ground floor level, the event level, and I'll kind of enter there on the right side at the main entry and kind of walk you around the building. As we enter into our main vestibule, we've got our ticketing office and lobby there below it in green and our retail sp space right above it that can be used for events within the Coliseum, but also for anything that's happening outside of the Coliseum when that's closed down. Um, we've got our nice big open lobby space, and then as we come up around, we've got our locker room shown there in orange on the top and our kitchen space that will serve not only this Coliseum, but other areas of the fairgrounds as well. And then we have a north lobby there. This, this building is a little bit unique in that it's kind of got two lobbies. It's got our main public lobby, lobby where ticketing comes in there on the right side. But then so many of our events are equine and livestock events that are related to the, to the barns there um, on our planned left side. And so those people will be coming in from that side. So we also wanted to create a lobby space for them as they enter into the building from that left side. So that's what that north lobby is. Um, as we go below that, we've got our big back of house area that leads into our arena floor. Um, for these kind of events that are out there so often, that back of house is a really critical element and something that makes this a unique coliseum or unique arena in the country. The ability to set that up and operate that uh, really perfectly for those kind of shows. So the way that happens is they'll come in, uh, animals and competitors will come in from that back house north 
compete on that arena floor, and then typically exit out that back house south and come back around that return alley there. So that nice big large return alley on the bottom portion is the other part that really makes this a unique arena unlike a typical basketball arena or something like that. Um, so all kinds of uh, animal functions will occur in that return alley as well. And then down in there on that south side, you see, like I said, a lot of our utilitarian functions, our mechanical rooms, our loading docks, storage, and things like that. As we get up on the second floor, this is our most of where our uh, public access will be. Um, this is the level that you'll access all of the seating from. So you'll come up that main staircase there on the right side. Nice big open concourse space surrounding that for vendors and exhibitors to, dis to uh, put their displays out, as well as the, the public bar right there below it in the purple. And then as we circle around the concourse, you'll see it's, it's really a pretty tight, efficient plan. We knew this, this plan needed to be basically as tight as we could get it um, to keep it economical. So you'll see essentially concession stands and restrooms are really what make up the majority of the space. The concession stands are in purple, and you can see we've located one in each quadrant of the building, so four main concession stands around the concourse, as well as that lounge space there on your left side as kind of more of one of those premium spaces that the lounge with the uh, low seating coming off of that. And we've also got a few suites there on your lower right side and our production area on the right side in green. Um, looking at this, we know this needs to be a flexible, multifunction uh, arena. And so we've got several different layouts. Here's just a few of them that we've shown here, showing how this can flex in capacity size depending on the event and what's needed. Um, so it can go from about 5,000 seats on those equine and livestock rodeo type events up to approximately 8,000 seats um, for basketball and concert type of layouts. Um, the architectural form. So when we, when we dove back into this, coming back to it as a MAPS project from the Public Works project, we knew we were going to need to be really efficient with our form and kind of take a step back and start from scratch on that. And so once we had the, the floor plan laid out, we put a really simple, efficient structure on top of that and then just essentially extruded that floor plan up through that to see what kind of shape that started to give us. Um, it already has kind of a unique shape because of how it fits on the site there. So from there, we started to delineate that shape uh, put roof wells in, see what we can do to, to kind of absorb even more square footage and get that thing as tight as we can uh, to make it as economical as possible. And then we start thinking about materials and what we want it to look like. So, of course, we have to consider the, the existing state fairgrounds palette and campus out there right next to the Bennett Event Center as well as connecting to the Super Barn eventually. We also want to make sure we're using d materials that are durable and economical and flexible. Uh, so we looked at things like these phenolic panels here. And then where does our inspiration come from? We looked at, um, for, our, for our materials, looking at patterns from the Native American uh, history that we have in the state, as well as the Western heritage that we see out there on the fairgrounds. So bringing those together as, as just influencers, as well as the movement that happens within that facility. You know, we've got really exciting events in there, like the equine rider you see there, and the basketball player that you see there. So how does that translate into the built environment? So that all came together to, to result in the building that you see here today before you. Um, you can see those patterns influenced on the upper portion, that light whitish gray uh, pattern that's there. It's kind of the feature element that wraps around the building. And then it's grounded by that masonry element that's so important for the durability out there at the fairgrounds with all the animals and equipment that we have out there. And it kind of grounds the, the, the building. As we come around to the west side, that, that pattern wraps around the building. We saw some opportunity there to, knowing that most people will see this from a little bit of a distance on, on I-44 and I-40, if you recall that first slide, um, to kind of integrate into the shading of that pattern, the big OKC graphic element that you see there on the far left side that you may be able to see from a distance. So something kind of cool there. And then as you come back around the east side, we've got a nice big open plaza uh, right there against the Coliseum that will eventually extend all the way to that super barn and provide just a ton of space for for all kinds of events, both for the State Fair as well as exhibitors um, and, and exhibits that go on during all of the horse shows out there and other events. As we come into the space, we've got a nice big open lobby space, two floors. Uh, you can see up to the concourse level where you're headed, as well as down from the concourse level into the, into the lobby space. And then when we get into the bowl, uh, this is the, that approximately 5,000 seat layout for a horse show. Um, we've got a nice 50 foot clear span or 50 foot high, clear height above the, above the event floor. So that would allow us to do uh, pretty much anything they want to do in there. That's kind of our critical point there. So we've made sure to capture that. And then coming around the space, of course, we've got those, a, a few of those premium spaces like the lounge that's shown on the, on the northwest side of the, of the arena there, 
um, bringing in some of those angular kind of wood elements as well into that space to try to have a cohesive design throughout. Construction budget on this is 84 million. Our latest estimate puts us right under that at 83.9. We are carrying five alternates currently. All of those are equipment and signage alternates. Um, with all of those, we have taken the approach of making sure that we, we essentially split those up so that any essential equipment that is required for the building to operate has been included in the base bid, and these alternates are kind of those extra elements. So for instance, on that alternate four signage package, all the code and wayfinding signage that's required for that building to operate is in the base bid. This is the extra um, decorative signage, graphic elements, things like that. Those come to just about $5 million. Our anticipated schedule, uh, the preliminary report was improved in December. Final plans and specs are starting right now, anticipated to uh, complete this summer in June, July area. Um, bidding and award will immediately follow that, and then construction begins right after that. So we're looking at a, about a two-year construction timeline on this, so hopefully it can be done by uh, September 2024, if not sooner. <coughs> And that's what I've got for you this morning. Okay, great. Thank you all so much for your time. Uh, happy to answer any questions you may have. Lovely, lovely presentation and beautiful building. Any questions? Yes, yes ma'am. I have a question about the parking. The, this new building looks like it's going to be over the parking area there. Mm -hmm. um, where is that parking going to be replaced? Because when I go, I, I want to have a good place to park. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's I important. To, I forgot to mention that. I'm so glad I brought that up. Good question. So if you can see right here, we are covering up some of that existing parking. Um, just if you look kind of just south and, and west a little bit of, of the existing Coliseum, you can see kind of that blank land that's just, just on the other side of the railroad tracks there. There's three structures on it. Uh, as part of a separate project, the fairgrounds is putting a new parking lot right there that will have essentially this, just about the same number of spots that we're um, taking over for this building. So that will offset the parking right there and be really close to the, to the new Coliseum. You're welcome. Thank you. Good question. Great Appreciate question. <laughs> Other questions? Comments? Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for well, being here with us today. Answer. I'll try to get there. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Have a good day. Okay. Okay. Moving on to item six. Um, staff, any comments? As you know, we started subcommittee meetings today, and I think it went really well. I'm excited to get subcommittees going, and, and you see that we're, we're moving, uh, moving projects, and, and we'll, we'll soon have a huge agenda of things like this. So we're off and running now. Everybody said they wanted us to move quickly, and we are, right? Uh, we are now. We are now. Great. Thank you. Um, board, any comments? Okay, Mr. Washington, you signed up for um, item six on our agenda. You have three minutes. Thank y'all, thank y'all. And by the way, when you look up at the, oh, this is here. This is here. <laughs> well, 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 I want to get back, since I've got my time now, I'm going to get back to this convergence, convergence development project. <laughs> this is quite interesting, I must say. <clears throat> now, according to the gentleman who spoke on this uh, item, who is recently gone now, he wants the Tax Increment Finance Committee to part with $13,750,000. Then he wants $10 million from this MAP4 project, as we know it's always been for 16 projects. Now, again, one of us with the intelligence here, not saying that you don't, but because I was listening, no disrespect to yours, it seems like to me then that what you're talking about is ringing and roaring and twisting around, trying to get around to borrow money that was designed or targeting 16 groups, 16 projects, now saying, oh, well, we can give it to them. Why? Because this helps out the innovation district that's already in progress and already has been developed, and we need another science project in that area. Again, some of us listens. Now, so you want to take not only that, but you want to tax increment finance that's not designed for this outside project and connection. There's no question that he has a direct, not just want to move in correction, connection to the innovation district because he wants to create, produce an innovation district hall, an innovation hall. So when you tie that in, that's telling me something that maybe this person has a far more connection to it than just moving in. So in other words, let's get, that gives me prestige to get what I want done to move into this innovation district. Innovation hall, let's let that. 
Why would he suddenly he want to come in and name an innovation hall if it wasn't something else? Was this just a cover up until he got here? This kind of <laughs> makes me question it. But my point concern here is we do not have the right to give this man $10 million for this project. One minute. Did this project, $4 million, for $10 million to mount for a project, is not designed to go for him. I, as a taxpaying citizen, voted for the 16 projects within which I was responsible for one of them being in that process with the Freedom Center. 16 projects was for this match for money. And nothing in that said that 17, 18, 19 other projects can come therein. So therefore, you're diverting funds away from what was actually intended for to go to somewhere else may indeed include a lawsuit being filed. I may file an injunction on that because it's not right. Now, the lady had no right, Ms. O'Connor, to come and tell us that the redevelopment authority runs this map for it. Uh-uh. They're not supposed to do that. They're not supposed to deal with anything that has nothing to do with them. The redevelopment authority, redevelopment, now I have to do a little more investigation on it. But Five I'm seconds. Gonna, I'm going to go to them now because I'm going to have fun in their place, and I mean real fun. Thank you all. It's been a blessing. Thank you again. Thank you. All righty. Any other comments? Yeah, I got none. No. <laughs> From the board or staff. <laughs> I'll be more clear. Okay, if not, um, we are uh, adjourned for this meeting. Thank you all so much for being here and for attending.